Hallelujah. How many of you love Jesus this morning? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. How many of you long to spend eternity with him this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. True. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of you believe that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. Believe that. How many of you believe that those who are alive when Jesus appears will be caught up, raptured to be with him? Mm-hmm. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. <coughs> How many of you believe the whole church will be caught up before the great tribulation starts? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jesus told a parable one time of the ten virgins. In that parable, it's the parable of the church. And he said they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom's coming. And that parable shows us that the whole church was asleep. And if you think about it, you ever snuggled in your bed, you're kind of half awake, but you're dreaming, and you're dreaming really pleasant dreams, and you just don't want to wake up from it? Mm -hmm. You just want to lay there because you're having this real pleasant dream. (laughs) And how many of you know that you're laying there some night and you have a dream that ain't so pleasant? You don't sleep, do you? You wake up. (laughs) It disturbs you. Mm -hmm. And you wake up. The Lord is sending out a wake-up call to His church this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. See, when it comes to eschatology or end-time study, there's actually three different views. Mm -hmm. There's two that have been popularly taught in the American church. you got futurism, where it teaches that the prophecies of Daniel and Matthew 24 and Revelation, all these are, are going to happen as some future event. And you got preterism, which teaches that most of that already happened. But then there's a third one I just found out about um, just a few weeks ago, and it, it's funny because um, this is historical. We got our historical little handout this morning. I love history. God's put that in my heart. Yeah. But this is historical in my life because in almost 20 years of preaching, I've never preached or taught on the end times yeah. because I never felt comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. I never felt... I, 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 the things that were popular and being taught in a popular vein didn't jive with scripture in my heart yeah. and so I wouldn't teach it Right. because I take that serious uh, Peter, I think it was Peter said that not many of you be teachers because we'll be judged more harshly Yeah. That's and true. so I never did but now yeah. after much fasting and praying and hours and hours of studying Daniel said knowledge will increase mm-hmm. and I spent, spent hours of studying church history and world history and the, and the Bible and seeing how it all jives and flows together. Mm. And see, there's a third way of studying end times, and it's called historicism. Mm. Okay? Historicism, the historicist school of prophetic interpretation results in the progressive and continuous fulfillment of prophecy. This continuous fulfillment starts in Daniel's time, 600 B.C., around there, continues through John the Revelator's time and up until the second coming of Jesus. It's historical. Mm -hmm. This this school of prophetic interpretation is not novel and it's not new. And even though I just heard of it a few weeks ago, when when I heard of it, I'm like, ding, 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 Johnny, tell me what he's won because that's where my heart's at. That's where the Lord's for me. Okay? It's not new. Biblical scholars throughout the centuries, actually from about 2 B.C. to the present, have ascribed to it. Daniel, John the Revelator, Hippolytus, Joachim, Wycliffe, Luther, Knox, Newton, and Wesley are examples of prominent people who believed in and used this historicist method to interpret interpret the prophetic scriptures. Another source... uh, from a Seventh-day Adventist Bible student source book, lists the Waldenses, the Hussites, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Zwingili, Melanchthon, John Gill, and the martyrs Cranmer, Tyndale, who gave us the first English translation of the Bible, Latimer, and Ridley as proponents of the historicist view of prophetic interpretation. Hallelujah. 
Mostly in American Christianity, we've heard two views, like I said earlier. Futurism, that teaches that all this is some future event. And preterism, which teaches that most of this happened. And the roots of those two ways of interpreting prophecy actually, and we're going to see it today as we look at history, they actually came from two different Catholics who, when the Reformers started studying the Scriptures and looking at things going on around them and that, they were pointing at the Pope as being the beast, the Catholic Church as being the beast of Revelation. And the Catholics are like, we can't have this, we need to counteract this. And so the Futurism view was brought into play by one of their people who the reasoning was, well, if all this is happening in some future time, then it can't be the Pope, can't be the, the Catholic Church. And then the other one was preterism, that if all this has already happened in the past, well, it can't be the Pope and it can't be the Catholic Church. And this is not to knock anybody, knock anybody's faith or, or, or religion, but the fact is, we have to speak truth. We have to look at history. There's people trying to erase American history right now. Oh, yeah. And if we don't look at history, we're going we're gonna to make mistakes. We're going to make the same failures that we've made in the past. Now, if you would this morning, turn with me to Matthew 24. And we're going to read the first 21 verses. We have the uh, we have the pre-tribulation rapture theory. It's a theory. It's a theory. We can't prove that it's it's a, it's a fact. It's a theory. It's been it's been taught. Twenty four. Matthew twenty four. But today I'm going to show you from a historicist point of view, and I want you to keep these scriptures in mind. I want you to think of the things you've read in Revelation. Um, in mind as we read the history of the church and let the wheels spin and just chew on this. Chew on this because God's calling for the church to wake up. So we're going to get a little bit uncomfortable here to shake us out of our slumber. Jesus is coming soon. He's Amen. coming soon. He's Amen. coming real soon. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Check Matthew 24, verse 24, verse 21 verses. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And, and Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Excuse me. Now as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? There's actually two questions there. When will these things be? Jesus said all these stones are not going to be left one on top of the other. Okay? And then what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's a second question. It's not all lumped together. as Some would like to lump it together. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Mm -hmm. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. <clears throat> Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then 
Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great... I want you to really pay attention to verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, this time when Jesus is speaking, nor ever shall be. Jesus is saying right here, when you see this abomination of desolation happening, when you see these things happening, then the great tribulation is going to start. There will be great tribulation such as there hasn't been since the creation up to this time I'm talking to you, or ever will be. That's a pretty powerful statement. And the, the Bible tells us that by the mouth of two or three witnesses of the matter established. Well, you can read the same account in, in Mark, and you can read it in Luke also. Yeah. There's yeah. three witnesses. There you go. Hallelujah. That's right. Mark 13, verses 14 through 27. Mark 13, starting at verse 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea see he's saying the same exact things that Matthew said. Mm -hmm. The same things. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 19, he says, For in those days there will be tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the creation which God created, until this time, the time Jesus is speaking, nor ever shall be, and unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect saved whom He chose, He shortened the days. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now if we look at Luke, Luke is going to help us understand even more about what this abomination of desolation is. So go with me to Luke 21. Right now we're talking about the abomination of desolation. And many teach that the, the temple is going to be rebuilt again, and that this is a future event. But if you really think about it, there's not any scriptures that say that. And if you think about it, when Jesus was crucified, the veil was torn, and that was an end of that sacrificial system. There's no need for another temple to be built because those sacrifices would be totally in vain anyway. So we're right. going to look at history today. That's right. Hallelujah. Luke 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For though these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles and until the time of Gentiles are fulfilled. And I believe that was probably 1948 when Jerusalem came back to being a nation. That's right. That's Hallelujah. Right. Yep. Verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them from fear and expect, expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, this is the good news. When these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That's right. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. 
Hallelujah. Now, if anybody else would like to do a, a more in-depth study, you can go to BarionBibleChurch.org and you can read more stuff of what we're going to look at today. Mm -hmm. um, from that website, abomination of desolation is a Hebrew expression meaning an abominable or hateful destroyer. To the Jews, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel brought to their minds the Assyrian ruler Antiochus Epiphanes. According to the Jewish history recorded in the Apocrypha, the pages in Daniel were fulfilled in the interest in interestamental period. First Maccabees records how Antiochus Epiphanes, who ruled Syria from 174 to 164 BC, came against Jerusalem. The Jews called what he did the abomination of desolation. They called it that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Antiochus had surnamed himself Epiphanes, which means the God made manifest. He's called himself God. It was his goal to stamp out the Jewish religion. A royal edict was proclaimed that suspended its practice under penalty and pain of death. He even turned priests' rooms and the temple chambers into public brothels. Mm -hmm. In December 168 BC, the temple was dedicated to Zeus. A statue of Zeus, which resembled Antiochus, was placed over the altar and a pig was sacrificed on the altar itself. This was a filthy abomination in the sight of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Josephus said of Antiochus Epiphanes, Josephus was a, a, a writer that lived in that time, a yes, writer, that's that right. wrote down historical facts, yes, so this did. is his recordings. There you go. He says he also spoiled the temple and put a stop to the constant practice of offering a daily sacrifice of expiation for three years and six months. Have you, have you heard of that before? Three and a half years? Oh, yeah. That someone he was going to put a stop to the sacrifices? That's right. He compelled the Jews to dissolve the laws of their country. He shall attempt to change laws. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And to keep their infants uncircumcised and to sacrifice swine's flesh upon the altar. This was the abomination of desolation the first time. Jesus said this abomination of desolation had been spoken of by Daniel the prophet. This expression, abomination of desolation, is found four times in Daniel. If you read through Daniel. He says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary, and the host to be trampled underfoot? And after sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off, and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week, three and a half years, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the week of abominations, on the wing of abominations, shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator of that time. And that's Daniel 9. <coughs> Excuse me. This passage of Daniel clearly refers to something which is to follow the coming of the death of Messiah, something connected with the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, we read in Luke, then know that its desolation has come near. Luke 21 20. And by reading the surrounding verses, you cannot deny that this is a parallel account to Matthew's account and to Mark's account. Luke just uses some different wording there, uh -huh. but he helps us to see it clearly. Sure. By combining Luke's statement with secular history, it is clear that Cestius Gallus and his Roman army were the abomination of desolation that Jesus warned about. It was fulfilled in AD 66 when the Romans surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Chrysostom wrote, he was another of, of our ancient uh, writers, fathers of the church, uh, historians. For this, it seems to me that the abomination of desolation means the army by which the holy city of Jerusalem was made desolate. Okay? Mm -hmm. Augustine wrote in AD 379, Luke shows that the abomination spoken of by Daniel will take place when Jerusalem is captured. He recalls these words of the Lord in the same context. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed about with an army, 
then know that the desolation thereof is at hand. For Luke very clearly bears witness that the prophecy of Daniel was fulfilled when Jerusalem was overthrown. Charles H. Spurgeon, wonderful man of God in 1888, this portion of our Savior's words appears to relate solely to this destruction of Jerusalem. As soon as Christ's disciples saw the abomination of desolation, that is, Roman ensigns with their idolatry stand in the holy place, they knew that the time for their escape had arrived, and they did flee to the mountains. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Albert Barnes wrote in 1949, mm -hmm. The abomination of desolation means the Roman army, and it is so explained by Luke 21.20. The Roman army is further called the abomination on account of the images of the emperor and the eagles carried in front of the legions and regarded by the Romans as divine honors. The Roman armies were an abomination and were considered desolating ones to the Jews not only because they consisted of heathen men and uncircumcised, excuse me, but also because of the images of their gods which were upon their ensigns, the poles they carried their flags upon. Mm -hmm. Such images and idols were always an abomination to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Our Lord informs his disciples that when they see the Roman armies encompassing Jerusalem with their ensigns flying, with the abominable images upon them, they should know that the desolation was at hand. This was, therefore, Christ's explanation of the abomination of desolation. The heathen Roman army, with its heathen images and standards, ready to sacrifice the idols on the temple altar and working the desolation of Jerusalem and the temple. Again, you can study this morning in depth if you like this sort of thing at buryinbiblechurch.org. Mm. So now we've clearly established what the abomination of desolation was, I hope. I hope this is interesting. Okay? Yeah. Now let us take a brief look at the Great Tribulation. According to Jesus in Matthew 24, 21 and Mark 13, 19, it is in those days there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the creation until this time. What time? The time that they've seen the abomination of desolation right after his days or ever will be. Jesus just said, this is going to be the start of the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. He's saying it. Mm -hmm. So in order for the pre-tribulation rapture theory to be truth, the church would have been raptured before that. Because pre-tribulation rapture theory means the church is raptured before the tribulation. Right. But here Jesus is saying when you see the stuff going on, it's going to be the start of the Great, great Tribulation. <laughs> and I believe history shows us and the Bible shows us that it goes like birth pains. And it's mm -hmm. been ongoing mm -hmm. right. birth pains. Yes. That's right. Yes. We're going to look yes. at that. Yes. We're waiting for the delivery of the baby, right? Amen. We're waiting for, we're waiting for the delivery. That's right. That's right. So we got to go through some, some pains. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yep. Hallelujah. When you read the book of Acts and study the history of the first century church, you'll see more of Jesus' words being fulfilled. Matthew 24, 9-14, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Right. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Okay? And, it, and that whole passage there, as you read through the book of Acts and look at history... You can see the persecution that the church went through from the Jews to start with. Yeah. This yes. was nothing compared to what we're going to see. Mm -hmm. The pre tribulation rapture theory is just that it's a theory. And we're looking at another theory today. A theory that I believe Scripture together with history shows to be more accurate. And the thing is, the Lord's put it on my heart that there's going to be many people if they have to start going through some of the things like we're going to read about here in a minute, they're going to freak out because they're going to think, wow, I thought we were supposed to be caught up before any of this, 
anything bad happen to the church. That's what we've heard taught. Mm -hmm. That the church is out of here before anything bad happens to the church, right? Yeah. Well, let's look at history. Hallelujah. See, we don't have to look for the Antichrist to appear. We just have to know that Jesus says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption is drawing near. But now let's look at some more of the Great Tribulation. We just look at, you know, that the, the Jews, Paul was one of them, persecuted the church. Mm -hmm. After the persecution of, by the Jews, we had the persecution by the Romans. Christians were beaten in jail. They were used as human torches. They were fed to wild animals. They were beheaded. The Roman Empire was extremely cruel to the church of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Peter was crucified upside down. Thomas was thrust through with a spear in India. Luke was hanged on an olive tree. Bartholomew was beaten and then crucified. Simon the Zealot was crucified in Britain in 74 AD. Philip was crucified in 54 AD. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Andrew was crucified on the cross with its two points in the ground. That's what's called the St. Andrew's cross. And Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria, trying to kill them. Mm -hmm. Wow. This yeah. is the heart of Jesus with them. Mm. If you want to read more about this history, you can go to BibleStudyTools.com, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During the first persecution, under Nero, some Christians were sewn up in the skins of wild beasts and then had the dogs sick on them until they attacked them and killed them. Wow. Among the numerous martyrs that suffered during this persecution was Simeon, Bishop of Jerusalem, who was crucified, and St. John, who was boiled in oil, and after, afterward banished Patmos, that's why we have his writings. Mm -hmm. Flavia, the daughter of a Roman senator, was likewise banished to Pontus, and a law was made well, like I said, think of Revelation and, and, and everything as we're studying this. A law was made that no Christian, once brought before the tribunal, should be exempted from punishment without renouncing his religion. So I'll make the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. This was the first persecution under Nero. Mm -hmm. In the third persecution, Pliny the second, a man learned and famous, seeing the lamentable slaughter of Christians, and moved there with the pity, wrote to Trajan, certifying him that there were many thousands of them daily put to death. Does that sound like the book of Revelation? Mm -hmm. Of which none did anything contrary to the Roman laws worthy of persecution. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Many thousands of them daily put to death. The church. Now if the pre-tribulation rapture theory was true, was the truth, why is the church going through this? Yeah, all right. The fourth persecution under Marcius Aurelius Antonius, A.D. 162. The cruelties used in this persecution were such that many of the spectators shuddered with horror at the sight and were astonished at the intrepidity of the sufferers. Some of the martyrs were obliged to pass with their already wounded feet over thorns, nails, sharp shells, etc. Upon their points, others were scourged until their sinews and veins lay bare, and after suffering the most excruciating tortures that could be devised, they were destroyed by the most terrible deaths. The per persecutions now extending to Africa Many were martyred in that quarter of the globe, the most particular of whom we shall mention. Perpetua, a married lady of about 22 years, those who suffered with her were Felicitas, a married lady, big with child at the time of her being apprehended, pregnant, and Provocatus, catchman of Carthage, and a slave. The names of the other prisoners destined to suffer upon this occasion were Saturninus, Secolinculus, and Satyr. On the day appointed for their execution, they were led to the amphitheater. 
Satur, Saturninus, and Ravacidus were ordered to run the gauntlet between the hunters or such as had care of the wild beasts. The hunters began being drawn up into two ranks. They ran between and were severely lashed as they passed through. Felicitas and Perpetua were stripped in order to be thrown to a mad bull, which made his first attack upon Perpetua and stunned her, and then he darted at Felicitas and gored her dreadfully. But not killing them, the executioner did that office with a sword. So here we got two women, one of them pregnant, ready to deliver, and they strip them naked as a spectacle, and they throw them out for a wild boar to go at them. Does that sound like great tribulation? Sure. Ravacidus and Satyr were destroyed by wild beasts. Saturninus was beheaded, and Secundus died in prison. These executions were in 205 on the eighth day of March. Here's an interesting factoid during the ninth persecution. I've got to skip through these. I can't go through all of them because there's a lot of information here. Yeah. And uh, 45 minutes, I've got to just I crossed, <laughs> out a lot of, I crossed out a lot of it. In the year of Christ, 286, a most remarkable affair occurred. A legion of soldiers consisting of 6,666 men contained nothing but Christians. Here's a whole legion of soldiers, 6,666 soldiers, all Christians. Maximian, about this time, ordered a general sacrifice at which the whole army was to assist. And likewise, he commanded that they should take an oath of allegiance and swear at the same time to assist in the extirpation of Christianity in Gaul. All right, all you soldiers, I all want you to swear an oath that you're going to help to wipe out Christianity and you're going to go forth and you're going to get rid of these horrible Christians. Alarmed with these orders, each individual of the Theban legion, the Christians, absolutely refused either to sacrifice or to take the oaths. This so greatly enraged Maximian that he ordered the legion to be decimated. That is, every tenth man to be selected out of the rest and put to the sword. This bloody order having been put in execution, those who remained alive were still inflexible. They still weren't going to do it. When a second decimation took place, and every tenth man of those living was put to death. This second severity made no more impression than the first had done. The soldiers persevered their fortitude and their principles, but by the advice of their officers, they drew up a loyal remonstrance to the emperor. This, it might have been presumed, would have softened the emperor, but it had a contrary effect. For enraged at their perseverance and unanimity, he commanded that the whole legion should be put to death, which was accordingly executed by the other troops who cut them to pieces with their swords, September 22, 286. A whole legion, 6,666 Christians, killed by the sword because they wouldn't bow their knee to a false idol and they wouldn't kill Christians. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the tenth persecution under Diocletian, A.D. 303. Under the Roman emperors, commonly called the Era of the Martyrs, was occasioned partly by the increasing number and luxury of the Christians, and the hatred of Galerius, the adopted son of Diocletian, who, being stimulated by his mother, a bigoted pagan, never ceased persuading the emperor to enter upon the persecution until he had accomplished his purpose. The fatal day fixed upon, the, upon to commence the bloody work was the 23rd of February, A.D. 303, that being the day in which the Terminio were celebrated, and on which, as the cruel pagans boasted, they hope to put a termination to Christianity. We're going to wipe out Christianity. We're getting rid of these Christians once and for all. On the appointed day, the persecution began in Nicomedia, on the morning of which the, perfect, the prefect of that city repaired, with a great number of officers and assistants, to the church of the Christians, where having forced open the doors, they seized upon all the sacred books and committed them to the flames. The whole of this transaction was in the presence of Diocletian and Galerius, who, not contented with the burning of the books, had the church leveled with the ground. 
This was followed by a severe edict commanding the destruction of all other Christians and books. We're getting rid of these people. We're going to wipe out all their writings, all their books, all their scrolls, and we're going to level all their churches. And an order soon succeeded to render Christians of all denominations outlaws. Sound like the book of Revelation, folks? Mm -hmm. Yes. The persecution became general in all the Roman provinces, but more particularly in the East, and it lasted 10 years. This is just the space. It is impossible to ascertain the numbers martyred or to enumerate the various modes of martyrdom. Racks, scourges, swords, daggers, crosses, poison, and famine were made use of in various parts to dispatch the Christians. And invention was exhausted to devise tortures against such as had no crime, but thinking differently from the votaries of superstition. Anybody that doesn't think like us, we're going to torture you, we're going to kill you, and they just use all wickedness and imagination to come up with new ways to torture. Mm -hmm. A city of Phrygia, I believe we read about that in the book of Acts, wasn't that one of the books of Paul's journeys? Sure. I believe. Consisting entirely of Christians, a whole city of Christians, was burnt and all the inhabitants perished in the flames. Does that sound like the Great Tribulation? Uh, Yeah. It is. So far, in around 300 AD, 300 years from the birth of the church, we've seen the entire region of Israel and the surrounding areas go through this. We see Greece, Spain, Great Britain, Africa, and the plot continues. Continuing in this tent persecution, this one was a, this one I, I found interesting. There's a cross between the floating axe head in the Old Testament and Jesus uh, having Peter walk on the water. Mm. Quirinius Bishop of Sicilia being carried before Matinus the governor was ordered to sacrifice to the pagan deities agreeably to the edicts of the various Roman emperors the governor perceiving his constancy sent him to jail and ordered him to be heavily ironed flattering himself that the hardships of a jail, some occasional tortures, and the weight of chains might overcome his resolution. I'm going to break this guy down by throwing him in jail, wrapping him in chains, and I'm going to break his, I'm going to break his, uh, his will to not deny Jesus. Mm-hmm. Being decided in his principles, he was sent to uh, Amantius, the principal governor of Pannonia, which is now Hungary, who loaded him with chains and carried him throughout the principal towns of the Danube River, exposing him to ridicule wherever he went. Arriving at length at Sabaria, and finding that Quirinius would not renounce his faith, he ordered him to be cast into a river with a stone fastened about his neck. Mm. This sentence being put into execution, Quirinius floated about for some time, and exhorting the people in the most pious terms concluded his admonition with this prayer. It is no new thing, O all-powerful Jesus, for thee to stop the course of rivers or to cause a man to walk upon the water as thou didst thy servant Peter. The people have already seen the proof of thy power in me. Grant me now to lay down my life for thy sake, O God. On pronouncing the last words, he immediately sank and died June 4, 8308. His body afterwards taken up and buried by some pious Christians. Mm. Mm. Wow. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Yes. And they love not their lives to the death. Amen. That's right. Amen. Jesus kept this man floating long enough to preach the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Persecutions under the Arian heretics. The author of the Arian heresy was Arius, a native of Libya and a priest of Alexandria who in 8318 began to publish his errors. He was condemned by a council of Libyan and Egyptian bishops, and that sentence was confirmed by the Council of, of Nice, AD 325. After the death of Constantine the Great, the Arians found means to ingratiate themselves into the favor of Emperor Constantinus, his son and successor in the East. And hence, a persecution was raised against the Orthodox bishops and clergy. The celebrated Anastasius and other bishops were banished 
and their sea is filled with Aryans. These heretics were taken over all their churches and parishes. In Egypt and Libya, 30 bishops were murdered, and many other Christians cruelly tormented. And 8386, George, the Arian bishop of Alexandria, under the authority of the emperor, began a persecution in that city and its surrounding, and carried it on with the most infernal severity. He was assisted in his diabolical malice by Cataphonius, governor of Egypt, Sebastian, general of the Egyptian forces, Faustinus, the treasurer, and Heraclius, a Roman officer. The persecutions now raged in such a manner that the clergy were driven from Alexandria, their churches were shut, and the severities practiced by the Arian heretics were as great as those that had been practiced by the pagan idolaters. If a man accused of being a Christian made his escape, then his whole family were massacred and all of his belongings oh, wow. were escaped. Wow. Does that sound like the Great Tribulation? <laughs> It is. It's a birth plan. Mm -hmm. In Alexandria, innumerable were the martyrs who suffered by the sword, burning, crucifixion, and stoning. In Arethusa, several were ripped open, and corn being put into their bellies, Swine were brought to feed therein, which in devouring the grain likewise devoured the entrails of the martyrs. They cut their bellies open, filled it with corn, threw them on the ground, and brought in the hogs and let them get eaten alive. Wow. So that brings us up to about 400 AD, 400 years of persecution or great tribulation. And this great tribulation continued on and on and on and on. If you read through Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll see it, it, just, it just keeps going. That's right. Yep. In the 11th century, in just one city, in the 11th century, one city, they put 7,236 persons to death. Wow. 11th century, 1,100 years. After the church was born, in one city, they put 7,236 people down. Now we start the papal persecutions, the popes, the Catholic Church. So far, our history of persecution has been confined to the pagan world. And now we come to a period when persecution, under the guise of Christianity, committed more enormities than ever disgraced the annals of paganism. Disregarding the maxims and the spirit of the gospel, the papal church, arming herself with the power of the sword, vets the church of God and wasted it for several centuries. A period most appropriately termed in history as the Dark Ages. The kings of the earth gave their power to the beast and submitted to be trodden on by the miserable vermin that often filled the papal chair, as in the case of Henry, emperor of Germany, the storm of papal persecution first burst upon the Waldenses in France. While all this tribulation was happening, okay, we're in the 11th century, but while that was going on between where we left off at 400 and 11, in uh, 610 AD, the false religion of Islam was born. And in the first 200 years of Islam, 67 million people were killed because they would not convert. 67 million. And if you do the math, and I looked up the history, the population of the world is estimated to be 200 million at the time. It makes it one-third of the population was murdered because they would not convert to this false religion. Wow. That's the great tribulation. Wow. That's, that's wow. Who do we think we are that God thinks more of us today, the church today, than he thought about the church in the, these hundreds of years? Right. Who are we? That's right. No, we got to overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony Amen. and love not Amen. our life to the death. That's, That's right. right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yep. God's no respecter of persons. He loves his church. Amen. That's but right. But he's making Amen. a statement with his church. Yeah. Satan, you're defeated. 
So now we have the Muslims and the Catholic Church persecuting anyone that wouldn't convert to their false religions. The atrocities of the popes and their emissaries were far worse than anything that the Roman or other pagans had thus far done to the Christians. When the church reformers came along, they were persecuted with extreme prejudice. Here were the men that were saying, wait a minute, you got it wrong, Mr. Pope. We're saved by grace working through, by faith working through grace. Grace working by faith. We're, we're saved by grace. People don't have to buy their way into heaven. They don't have to buy their loved ones' ways out of, out of purgatory. That's not the gospel. And so the, the, uh, the Protestant Reformation began. <coughs> and the Catholics went after him with extreme prejudice. Here's just one example. The Bartholomew Master at Paris in the surrounding areas. On the 22nd day of August, 1572, commenced this diabolical act of sanguinary brutality. It was intended to destroy at one stroke the root of the Protestant tree, which had only before partially suffered in its branches. The King of France had artfully proposed a marriage between his sister and the Prince of Navarre, the captain and prince of the Protestants. The soldiers were appointed at a certain signal to burst out instantly to the slaughter in all parts of the city. When they had killed the admiral, they threw him out a window into the street where his head was cut off and sent to the Pope. The savage Papists, still raging against him, cut off his arms and private members, and after dragging him three days through the streets, hung him by the heels outside of the city. After him, they slew many great and honorable persons who were Protestants, as Count Rochefort, Tellinus, the admiral's son-in-law, Antonius Claremontus, Marquis of Ragley, Louis Bussius, Bandolinus, Pugli, and lots of other names that are hard to pronounce. And falling upon the common people, they continued the slaughter for many days. In the three first, day, first three days, they slew of all ranks and condition to the number of 10,000. 10,000 people in the first three days of the slaughter. 10,000 people. The bodies were thrown into the rivers, and blood ran through the streets with a strong current. That's a lot of blood. And the river appeared presently like a stream of blood. So furious was their hellish rage that they slew all Papists whom they suspected to not be very staunch in their diabolical religion. So they were even taking Catholics who they didn't think were real faithful and killing them, along with the Protestants. From Paris, the destruction spread to all quarters of the realm. At Orleans, a thousand were slain of men, women, and children, and six thousand at ruin. At Maldives, 200 were put into prison and later brought out by units and cruelly murdered. At Lyons, 800 were massacred. Here, children hanging about their parents and parents affectionately embracing their children were pleasant food for the swords and the bloodthirsty minds of those who call themselves the Catholic Church. Here, 300 were slain in the bishop's house and the impious monks would suffer none to be married. Can you imagine your little granddaughter clinging to your leg and you clinging to her and they didn't give a rip, they just... Great tribulation. <clears throat> At August, August of Ona, on the people hearing of the massacre at Paris, they shut their gates that no Protestants might escape, and searching diligently for every individual of the Reformed Church, imprisoned and then barbarously murdered them. You ain't getting out of our city. We're closing the gates and we're hunting you down. Does that sound like the book of Revelation? Yeah. The same cruelty they practice at Aver Avericum, at Troyes, at Taulus, ruined in many other places, running from city to city, towns and villages through the kingdom. As a corroboration of this horrid carnage, the following interesting narrative, written by a sensible and learned Roman Catholic, appears in this place with peculiar propriety. <coughs> this writing is from one of the Catholics. The nuptial, says he, of the young king of Navarre, this all happened as a scheme when it, uh, the king's sister vowed to marry this uh, prince, uh, this captain of the uh, reformers. 
of the Protestants. The nuptials, says he, of the young king of Navarre with the French king's sister was solemnized with pomp, and all the endearments, all the assurances of friendship, all the oaths sacred among men were profusely lavished by Catherine, the queen mother, and by the king, during which the rest of the court thought of nothing but festivities, plays, and masquerades, kind of like the church today. At last, at 12 o'clock at night, at midnight, on the eve of St. Bartholomew, the signal was given. Immediately, all the houses of the Protestants were forced open at once. Admiral Coligny, alarmed by the uproar, jumped out of bed when a company of assassins rushed into his chamber. They were headed by one Vesemi, who had been bred up as a domestic in the family of the Guises. This wretch thrust his sword into the Admiral's breast and cut him in the face. In the meantime, all the friends of Coligny were assassinated throughout Paris. Men, women, and children were promiscuously slaughtered, and every street was strewed with expiring bodies. Can you picture that? Can you picture that? Bodies laying all over the place. <coughs> Some priest holding up a crucifix in one hand and a dagger in the other ran to the chiefs of the murders and strongly exhorted them to spare neither relations or friends. Many of the wretched victims fled to the waterside and some swam over the Seine River to the suburbs of St. Germain. The king saw them from his window, which looked upon the river, and fired upon them with the carbon that had been loaded for that purpose by one of his pages. While the queen mother, undisturbed and serene in the midst of slaughter, looking down from a balcony, encouraged the murderers and laughed at the dying groans of the slaughter. This barbarous queen was fired with a restless ambition, and she perpetually shifted her party in order to satiate it. Okay. Bringing her into, into a landing now. So, what we've got here is many birth banks of the Great Tribulation. Many birth banks. If the church went through these things, How do we think we're not going to go through life again? Right. How do we think we're going to be magically raptured and get out of this? We're not. We're not. We're not. We can go through the same horrors. Yeah. And I'm afraid that those that think that think they're going to be raptured out before that, when they find themselves in the middle of this, they're going to stumble. They're going to fall. They're going to walk away from their faith. Wow. Jesus let us down because we were supposed to be gone before this happened. And I think it's really going to hurt. And that's why God's put it on my heart to sound this wake up call. Yes, sir. It's happening now. Yeah. Not many uh, here in the United States, but in other countries, uh, Christians are, are underground because they are being persecuted. Yes. And when it comes to United States, you know, uh, people is going to be panicking is because they think, well, we live in the United States, you know, we're a free country, but uh, we need to be ready. I mean, when it comes to persecution of the Christian, you know, maybe you cannot uh, hide it from, from, from persecution, but we need to be ready that when we are persecuted, we need not to be feared because, you know, if you lose your life, you're going to be with Jesus, yes, you know? Right. I mean, yes. if you are lived here alive, then you would be a witness. But if, you know, if, if you are persecuted and your life is um, uh, lost, you know, then you've gained. Amen. Actually, Amen. you've gained, Amen. you know, because you're going, you're going Amen. to heaven. Amen. But we don't need to fear that that we need to dig a hole and hide. No. But you know, as a Christians, we we got we got a guarantee that if we lose our life, Hallelujah, glory to God, Amen. we're gone. You know? Amen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's happening Amen. now. Yeah. Yes, it is. Amen. It's happening now. I mean, we I need just, to. I just watched a news report from just a few weeks ago in China. Yeah. yeah, we need yes. to be ready. Yeah, we need to be ready. 
So, all over. But if you tried to teach this, this is pre trib rapture theory to the church of this day, they'd have laughed you out of town. And if you tried to teach, teach it in, in China and some of these other countries, they'd throw you out on a rail. Yeah. yeah. Because they're going through it. Yeah. And now the American church needs to wake up because exactly. Jesus is coming. Exactly. Yeah. When yeah. you see these things happening, yeah. look up for your redemption. You're hearing God. now, I don't listen to news, that you're hearing now that, you know, uh, churches might lose our freedom having services. Amen. Right. You know? Yep. I mean, you, you know, Jesus is coming soon. We don't know when, but the the key is we need to be ready. We, need to be ready. Yes. we don't need to fear no. that we're going to be persecuted, no. but we need to be ready that when the time comes, Amen. hallelujah, glory Jesus to God. Don't fear him who can destroy yeah. your body. I'm out of here. Don't fear him who can destroy your body. That's right. That's Look right. at this man, chains and a stone thrown around his neck and they threw him in the river. Well, guess what? Jesus said his time wasn't up till he got done preaching. That's right. Are we going to be able to do that? That's yeah. right. Yep. Are you going to have the fortitude to not deny Jesus? That's right. And right. preach and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I don't know why my alarm went off. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking maybe I left it on AM instead of PM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I was just getting wound up too. Yeah, I was. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thank you, brother. God Amen. bless. You know, uh, he had a lot to read and a lot to soak in. And go to that website. What was it again? Uh, Bar Barian. BarianBibleChurch.org is one of them. And the other one was... Is that a church? The other, one is, Bi the other one is BibleStudyTools.com. Right. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, the Varian, is that a college or theological? I'm not sure. I'm not really sure on that, but you can go. I think to it that. was a church. Okay, and you can go to that website. You know what's interesting he was talking about in the beginning? About uh, he never really got onto these end time eschatology studies. And I'm not really like that much myself. Now, I know some of us in the past remember Bobby. Bobby really got in deep on that. Yes. And uh, and I've heard all kinds of views as well, the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, all those kind of things. And I thought my head was spinning. I just didn't know what to, <laughs> where to go. But there was always something that intrigued me as he was reading scripture in Matthew and 24, when the Lord, he said this, and I thought, he's talking to his disciples, and then he said, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to them. You know, yeah. he was saying, you are going to do, if he was talking to them, that's 2,000 years ago. That's right. 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 Yeah. And I thought to myself, why are they putting this way ahead? When I'm looking at it, he's directing his words directly to them. Am I right? Amen. And that always puzzled me about that. A and big clue is he says, let those who are in Judea flee. Yeah. He's not talking to the whole world at that point. He's talking to those who are in those Judea. Those in that time. Era. Now, in church history is very important. Now, all these resources that Brother Smoke was talking about, I, I have the same resources as well. Uh, you know, um, Charles Spurgeon... Albert Barnes and all these others are very, uh, very uh, recognizable, very good uh, church history facts that they bring out. Uh, so those he was quoting are very, very, very on top. The best, you know, so church history speaks for itself, right? Yeah. yeah. If I could just add, the pre-tribulation rapture theory didn't come to America until about 1831. Uh, Darby brought it. He heard a young girl prophesy about a pre-tribulation catch catching away of the saints in Ireland. And he brought the teaching back to America in like 1831. And then um, also the, the big printing company, uh, Mooney, Moody, 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 Moody Probation, yeah. okay, he caught on to it. And at the time, the Assembly of God got all their teaching materials from Moody because they didn't have their own printers. 
And so that's where the Assembly of God grabbed onto that teaching. Probably. If you study out the uh, history, yeah. Yeah, because I know they believe in the pre-trip yep. too, right? And that's yeah. where that all came from. If you follow uh, from, the, yeah, follow the money like uh, the FBI does when they're investing. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, I'll be honest, I like pre-trip. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if Amen. I get out of here before all this stuff happens, I, I get it. I understand. But I never really fully known for sure. You know what I mean? I didn't really know. I've heard, like I said, there's so much study out there on these end times. But I think when I look at church history, and I used to think the same thing, if they went through so much suffering as they did, persecution, tribulation, what do we think we are? You know, are we any different? Uh, they were in a grace period just like we are. That's right. Jesus said, yes, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, you know, I, I, I just like my wife said, be ready because, you know, uh, look up. And the thing is, don't freak out or maybe I shouldn't use that word freak out, but don't panic, you know, because what you see is happening in our times. God, I believe, gives us the grace to do he, didn't, he called us for such a time as this. We're alive because He meant for it to be. So yeah. whatever we face here on this planet, we have an anointing from God. We have a grace from God to do it, to finish our work. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, so it's very important. So understand those things. A lot of study. There's a, when it comes to eschatology, there's a lot of study, a lot of, as you know, you read a lot and give you some things, background, what's going on, and what happens. So there's a lot there. But I tell you what, once you dive into it, you'll just keep getting deeper and deeper, and, and things will come out a little bit better for you. So with that, praise the Lord. We've got to receive communion. Amen. And boy, what a time we can receive it right now. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. All right. Let, okay, why don't you all come up in the circle here, and uh, <coughs> my wife will just distribute it to you all. And uh, I'll read passages of scripture, and so I can let you guys out of here and uh, enjoy your day, your week. And you know what? What the thing is? Sometimes the church has to be alarmed to what goes on, because we can get so comfortable and not think about things. And the Lord said, "Always be on your guard." You know, He says, "Don't fear. You don't have to fear, but be on your guard." Always be looking up. And the Lord said, For I received from the Lord, the Paul said, What I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There's that word remembrance again. And I think what we got to remember is remember what God told us. <laughs> okay? And remember this. He said, do this in remembrance of me. That's important. Remember the blood of Jesus. Remember the sacrifice. And... Uh, this is what communion is all about for all of us, amen? And it's a time of solitude, intimacy with God. So, let's remember what He done for us. And all this, He paid the price. And you remember the Lord. He, said, he went through great persecution, did He not? He went through a lot. I mean, to death, as a matter of fact. So we see that in Scripture. And he says uh, that we will also go through tribulation as well. And there is tribulation. Throughout history, you can see that. Amen. There's a lot to think about, a lot to chew on, and uh, a lot to really consider. Hey, I, do, I have that book, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. When you start reading that, if you get that book, yeah, I recommend you get it. Because it will tell you church history, all of those that went to great persecution and tribulation for the Lord. It is, it will make your hair stand up or lose it like me. Praise God. Amen. 
I want you to know that. I'm telling you, it, it, it really is something else. So I agree with Smoke on this too in this area when it comes to uh, what church history went through, what makes think that we may not go through a lot ourselves. I've never forgotten about that. And when I look at scripture, I, I, I have to keep my mind, my heart open to such things. Okay? Yes. And we have to be prepared at all times. But don't be to the point to where we're not aware of what could happen. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? And don't be shocked or alarmed when persecution and tribulation comes because the Lord said it would. Okay? So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus. And remember, Lord, that when we receive this Holy Communion from you, Lord, we can close our eyes and may our souls be open, wide open to you to remember what you've done and put you at the center of our heart. Because, Lord, you are our life. We align with you. We agree with your word. We stand upon your word. We know that nothing, uh, whatever comes our way, will not first have to face you in our life. In other words, Lord, well, you've already gone before us. Others have laid out the path for us. Others have shed their blood as well. And we remember those too, Lord, here today that went through great extremities that boggles our mind to believe what great persecution others have went through. It, it, it's amazing. And I pray, God, you give us the grace, the blessing, the strength, the power, and the boldness to take our stand and never deny what Jesus has done. And never deny our faith. Never deny who we are in Jesus. God, give us that grace to never back down whatsoever, just like these others, martyrs of you, in Jesus' name. We remember, Lord, what their sacrifice was, but most of all, because of your sacrifice, they were able to sacrifice yes. their lives. Thank you so much. We remember you for today, in Jesus' name. Protect you, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. And um, I'm gonna pray over the cup. Father, we thank you for sending your only son that we can have life. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you have done at the cross. Because of what you accomplished at the cross, we can we can have peace, victory. We don't have to fear what's going to happen in this world. But Lord, when the time comes for us to go home, we praise you and we worship you, give you glory. And Lord, I thank you for what you have done, for shedding your blood. Hallelujah. We overcame by the blood of the Lamb Amen. and by our word, the, our word of testimony. Amen. Hallelujah. We got testimony. Hallelujah. We thank you for the blood because there is power in the blood. There is power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for redeeming us, Lord. Thank you for giving us new life and more abundantly. Amen. Amen. I'll protect Amen. Amen. Oh, blessed the Lord. Oh, blessed the Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, did you all receive something today? Yes. I'm telling you what. It's uh, not to fear. Don't be in fear. That's what the devil wants you to do. No, no, no. This is a day and time. Look up when your redemption draws nigh. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Love you. God bless you. Uh, enjoy your day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, praise God. She's the only one of them that's not her, um, her dad's not blue eyes. Love you, Chris. Love you. Yeah. Bless you. Yeah. This is many babies. No, no, no. Many babies. I'm sorry. I'm learning more about Dr. Mom. I'll be here for the next two days. Yeah, it's good. 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 Yeah, it's good.
That's still on. That's still on. Sally, you're still on. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye.